Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're streaming live from the Boathouse at Confluence Park and I'd like to welcome you. My name is Jane Scott and it's a privilege and an honor to serve as the president and the CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to welcome you to our forum today. You know, we're so used to hosting hundreds of people here in the room at the Boathouse every Wednesday for our lunch forums. It's, it's just really difficult. We still miss all of you terribly, but we're very, very grateful for the technology that allows us to come to you and to bring our programs to you every Wednesday. We know we've made a lot of new friends through our YouTube and through NBC4 and our live, uh, live stream through uh, the channels. And some of you may not know that the Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded by 13 women leaders in 1976 at a time when women weren't necessarily always invited into the men's clubs. So they started their own organization and they wanted it to be 100% inclusive from the very beginning. Today, <clears throat> as a 501c3 nonprofit, we fulfill our mission of connecting people and ideas through community conversation with the support of nearly 1,500 members and more than 100 companies and organizations who support us through their sponsorships and with personal donations from people like you. Today, we'd like to welcome a couple of new members, Loann Crane and Emily Christian of the OSU Wexner Medical Center. So thank you, Loanne and Emily, and welcome to CMC. We'd also like to thank those of you who purchased virtual seats for this forum. We're very, very grateful to all of you throughout our live streaming series who have purchased virtual seats. It's really grateful for that special support. So you can join, renew your membership, or donate to the Columbus Metropolitan Club, actually even during this broadcast, or anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Today's CMC Forum has support from Cardinal Health and the Puffin Foundation West, who would like to recognize and honor Dr. Mark Earl Pierce, one of the heroes at OSU Wexner Medical Center. Our partners for the live stream special report series are NBC4, NBC4i, WOSU Public Media, PNC, the Tom E. Daly Foundation, MORPC, the Dispatch Media Group, and OSU Wexner Medical Center. You know, crisis tends to bring out and expose our weaknesses, but it also creates opportunities for us to show our strengths. Local institutions are working together to innovate and overcome many obstacles right now and to provide solutions for professionals on the front lines and to create significant impact and even are garnering national recognition. To discuss some of the unique collaborations that are going on in our community, let's welcome Executive Vice President and Chancellor for Health Affairs at The Ohio State University and CEO of the OSU Wexner Medical Center, Dr. Hal Paz, President and CEO of Battelle, Lou Von Thayer, welcome, and our host, Emmy, winning award, Emmy award winning journalist, host of NBC4, The Spectrum, and a CMC board member, Colleen Marshall. So Colleen, we're really looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, too. And we have to start with the collaboration between Battelle and OSU on the front lines in the crisis for PPE. I, I, I think I'm going to talk with you, Lou, and this was, not, this, this was not a new process for Battelle, cleaning, sterilizing, right. but how is it that you took it from something that you knew about to what it is today? Well, it's really a great story. Um, and it's one of the things we've always tried to make Patel an agile organization and sometimes you wonder if you're getting there or not and this is an example of just how agile I think our company is able to become. Uh, one of our engineers, Kevin Hamama, and he had worked a study for the FDA about five years ago and the results of that study, uh, the FDA had actually looked at if you ever had an emergency, could you clean these N95 masks? So we had had the opportunity to do trade studies, try lots of different things. So because of that, we knew the best way to clean it. We knew you could do it 20 times without damaging it. We knew where the limits all were. But we never thought about doing more than one or two of them at a time. Uh, so when this started, and um, what we did at Patel was, it was once we kind of saw the virus coming out of China, there was one particular day, I think it was late January, where Singapore had uh, 10 times surge in their number of cases. 
And uh, myself and our team kind of said, uh-oh, you know, Singapore has the same number of visitors that come uh, every year from China as the United States does. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to come here. We, we need to get ready. Uh, so we kind of threw caution to the wind. I told our leadership team, don't worry about costs. Let's be innovative, figure out what we could do. And Kevin's wife works at Ohio Health, and uh, the two of them had a conversation at dinner. Uh, he shot an email to one of our managers, and within nine days, um, we actually built, tested the system, and in a few more days got FDA approval to operate it. Uh, so the speed, I mean, people literally worked around the clock. Uh, we knew it was important. We knew this could save lives. And, and as I talked to Hal, as I talked to other hospital leaders, uh, we knew just how bad, and my daughter's a doctor in Atlanta, um, we knew just how bad already the PPE um, challenges were, uh, and it was going to get worse. So it was really exciting to watch this come together. Uh, since then, we've gotten a federal contract. We've actually built 60 of these systems in literally five weeks from the first day. Uh, 38 of them are, or 48 of them are deployed around the country now and operating. And um, you know, we've added 800 people to the company, and we're out, out doing it. And uh, Ohio State has picked up and is using the system. And, and one of the things we've learned along the way is it's really hard for doctors and nurses that have spent their whole career throwing these things away to suddenly adapt to saving them. And um, Hal and, and other leaders like him have, have helped those hospital systems kind of think through this and figure out and help us understand what goes on inside the hospital. And how did that roll out at Ohio State? Because as he said, you've got thousands of employees sure. who are used to doing this and mm -hmm. tossing them because that's what they've been taught. Those are one use. That's right. So how, that's almost a culture shift. Yeah, and you know, it, it is really important to address what is a system. And uh, without a doubt, at, at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center, the first thing we did was stop elective surgery because we were concerned about running out of all of these protective equipment, PPE as it's called. So anything we could do to address what we call supply chain issues, to get more of the masks, to get the gowns, sterile gloves, all those things were extraordinarily important. So when Lou called me and told me about this opportunity, um, we were on board instantaneously. But the challenge was our doctors and nurses are taught to dispose of everything. So we had to go back in to all the wards where we were ca caring for patients, uh, our outpatient clinics, and then change the system so that you couldn't just throw those masks in a waste paper, a, a certain waste paper basket, but they had to go to a very special uh, receiving uh, vessel that we would then ship over to Battelle. And um, it was, the, as Lou knows, the first week or two were challenging to change a practice that has been going on for decades. But today, over 90% of those N95 masks are being recycled, and uh, we continue to get them back uh, from Battelle. You might ask, well, why not 100%? Well, as we've learned with Battelle over the past two months, if uh, someone unfortunately gets cosmetics or, or lotion or something on the mask, they can't be reused. So then we had to train staff to make sure they weren't wearing cosmetics or lotions so that um, they could just throw it into this special receptacle and get it recycled. But it's been extraordinary. It's been a game changer. We wanted to make sure that we could protect our workforce as much as we would protect every single patient that goes through the Wexner Medical Center. And I'm exceptionally proud of the fact that less than 1% of our entire workforce has actually been infected with the COVID virus. And many of those we know through contact tracing didn't even get infected at the medical center. They got infected at home or out in the community. And it's because of these kinds of things, because of the masks, the work with Battelle, that we're able to have these kind of results, which at the end of the day is so important for our community. It must be frustrating for both of you to hear people say, well, this isn't that bad. I don't need a mask. I'm, I, I'm a free American. How do you react when you hear that, when you were working so hard to keep your people safe? Why don't you start? You're living, it. You're living in the middle of it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, should, I should let you know, Colleen, I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician. And for the, you know, better part of my career, I was, in fact, doing these kinds of things and, and caring for patients uh, with infectious diseases of various sorts who had pneumonias that put them in the intensive care unit. And that's exactly what all the concern is about here with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, the most important thing that we can do as a society is to stop the spread, stop the spread. And those things are not high tech. These things are basic. Wear a mask, wash your hands, don't touch your eyes, nose or throat. Do those things. 
be six feet apart at the minimum from anybody else. And you as an individual will do so much to prevent the spread and prevent someone who is at risk for winding up in the hospital or in the ICU from getting critically ill. That's what it's all about. These masks are really doing more to protect somebody else than to protect us. The N95 mask that Battelle is recycling for us and for other hospitals and other states will stop 95% of the small particles from getting into our lungs. These masks don't do that. What these masks do is when we cough, sneeze, or we talk loudly and our, our sputum gets aerosolized, we'll stop this from getting out in the air and that protects others. So when you wear the mask, you're doing more to protect your family, your colleagues, your friends, and people in your community. And that's why this is so important. And when you hear that, and I know you also have been worried about protecting your people, you have right. a percentage of them working from home. What's your yeah. reaction when you are hearing and seeing on social media every day, this is a hoax? I, I would just put it this way. Um, you know Battelle does defense contracting, and I came from that environment. I've spent most of my career doing that. A good intelligence operation is when nobody ever knows about it and nothing bad ever happens. So I, I think the leadership that the governor has shown, the work we did to keep from being overwhelmed by cases, and you can look at what's happening in other countries when the hospitals get overwhelmed, you know, 3x more people die, uh, 10, 10x more people get exposed. Uh, so the fact that didn't happen is a really good thing and we dodged a bullet and, and we can now keep up with this longer. We can give more time until treatments and vaccines can come along, which both of our organizations are heavily involved with. So I, I think it's a huge success that we didn't have a crisis and now for others to look in and, you know, it's only natural for people to look in and say, well, it wasn't that bad. We shouldn't have stopped. Uh, I suspect it would have been that bad and we've seen that in other populations around the world. Uh, it would have been very bad here if we hadn't done anything. So I, I give the governor, lieutenant governor, um, Great credit. Uh, we've been pretty close through this whole thing, and uh, we're lucky to have them here in Ohio. They've been driving and, and doing good things for to save Ohioans. Ohio really did set a standard pretty early on, didn't it? Without a doubt. I think uh, the steps that we took as a state have been extraordinary, and as a result, we've had significant success in flattening the curve. And it's because of all the things that we did here. We, for example, as a state, stopped elective uh, health care procedures, medical procedures to preserve PPE, to keep people out of the hospital as much as possible so we could focus resources on caring for those that get infected and become sick and need hospitalization. Here in Columbus, through uh, the partnerships we have, uh, the four health systems, so the, uh, the other two adult hospital systems and nationwide children's, we got together and we said, what can we do to collaborate to address this? We went, we took over the convention center, we created a facility should there need to be a, uh, more hospital beds for COVID positive patients, we would have a place to do that. And then we tied in all the 40 or so community hospitals in central and southeast uh, Ohio so that we could also address any COVID positive cases in those communities too that needed hospitalization. And the great news, and this is really what's extraordinary, that convention center was for what we call surge level three. So that's after we've exhausted all the hospital beds at uh, Wexner Medical Center, at Ohio Health, at um, Mount Carmel, and at Nationwide. And now we needed to have, um, using other facilities, like having patients in recovery rooms, using uh, other areas that we typically don't use. That's the level two surge. Level three is when you've exhausted every possible place in those buildings for care. The great news is because all the steps we took as a state, and without a doubt, as Lou said, the leadership that we've had from the governor, the lieutenant governor, and from our director of public health in doing things early on, we never even got to the top of surge one. We never got to using the full capacity of beds that we had here in Columbus. And if we continue to follow these very common sense approaches, my hope is we never will have to because this is not ending this week. This infection is still around and until there is a vaccine, until enough people have immunity, neither of which we have enough data on right now, we're going to have to take all the steps we're doing. But we know it works. Um, we're op reopening a lot of businesses and I've had the opportunity to talk with CEOs of many of these businesses that are trying to reopen. And the advice I give them is, look, the hospitals in this state in this community have never closed. They've continued to be open. And think about all the things that we've done 
to achieve the results I said before. Less than 1% of our workforce, not are sick in the hospital, but just tested positive. Less than 1%. How did we get there? Well, number one, we asked every employee to check their temperature before they left their home. I did that myself this morning. They fill out a, a series of questions on their phone, and their phone turns green. If it turns red, they don't come to work. If they don't have a thermometer, we'll check it for them at the door. They put a mask on as soon as they come in, and then they practice all the basic things that we said before. If we can continue to do that as a community and a society, and I know Battelle is doing that as well, that's how we address this pandemic till there's a vaccine. So instead of looking at it as overkill, we have to look at it as a success story. I think so. Yes. Let's talk about the vaccine. You are both involved in that. And I think, Lou, you mentioned earlier that your company, uh, that Battelle, is in, in contact and connection with most of the companies working on these vaccines, right? Yes. So, so one of the things Battelle does is we don't design actual vaccines, and that's what uh, OSU and, and, and the large other companies do. Uh, but we do a lot of the test support, a lot of the uh, trial support, uh, the safety, efficacy. Uh, work for many of these companies. So we've got probably at least a dozen companies in Battelle right now uh, working on parts of the vaccine with us, parts with other people, uh, as particularly this messenger RNA, which is a, a new type of treatment um, that has promise but hasn't been used before, and, and you've seen some in the press. Um, you know, some interesting early, very small numbers, but early results look promising. So. You know, normally, and Hal can tell you much better than I can, I think normally we do a lot of vaccine work uh, across Battelle, as we've been doing it for decades. Normally, a 10, 12 years is about what it takes. Um, with all the effort and all the collaboration that we see happening this time, with the uh, funding going in, um, I don't know if it's going to happen in a year, but I'm optimistic it's going to happen very, very fast compared to our history. I see you nodding your head, Doctor. And we've heard in the early stages of this pandemic it takes 18 months to two years to get a vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's the quickest mm -hmm. it can happen mm -hmm. because there are efficacy and safety concerns. There's been optimism that this could be much quicker. Is it realistic optimism? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, the, the record, I believe, for any one vaccine is about four years, four or five years to develop a new vaccine. So everything that we're doing today is uh, seeking to certainly break that record by a lot. But the big difference is, is that in the past, it would be a couple of different uh, companies working to manufacture a vaccine. This is an all-out global effort, and there's so many different organizations, both governmental as well as companies, trying to produce a successful vaccine. I find that very encouraging, and I'm very hopeful that what uh, Tony Fauci, who's um, you know, a phenomenal and world-renowned infectious disease specialist is, has said is, is accurate, that it is possible that in a year to a year and a half, the earliest being somewhere around January, which is one year from when the viral DNA, RNA, excuse me, was first identified, that we could have a vaccine. So that, to me, is very encouraging. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there are viruses in our community, for example, HIV, despite decades of research for which there is still no vaccine. So we have to temper that enthusiasm and, and that hope with the realities that not every virus allows us to develop a vaccine to prevent its spread, and we have to remember that. So um, I think that uh, the work will continue. This is really, really encouraging, but again, it gets back, Colleen, to what we talked about earlier. In the meantime, we need to make sure that we're doing all the things that allow individuals to protect themselves and people in their community. The other thing I, I would say is this, is that um, the other tests, and there are two tests here, and there's another one that I'm sure Lou would love to talk about, which is the test for the virus itself. Um, but the other test is the test for the antibodies to the, to the virus. Both um, Battelle and Ohio State Wexner are partnering on, on both of these tests. Um, understanding who has antibodies to the virus is incredibly important because if we can identify individuals that have the antibodies to the virus, that means that they were infected. And if they have a certain kind of antibody, uh, a neutralizing antibody, if they carry that and we can show that that gives them immunity, then in a sense, anyone that was ever infected would have the potential and possibility of being basically vaccinated, so to speak, through their immunity for some period of time. 
Now, we don't know if these antibodies, number one, protect you. Number two, if they do protect you, is it six months of protection? Is it a year and a half of protection? But we're hopeful that's the case, because the other coronaviruses that cause the common cold typically, and this is epidemiologic data, give us protection often for six months to 18 months. So we're hopeful that we're going to prove the same thing here. But until we do the research and until we have the data to show it, it's, it's, it's a hope and an assumption, but not proven. So that's why this joint work that we're doing on the antibody test is so important. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that test? I see you nodding your sure. head. This, this sounds very hopeful. Well, well, first I'd like to start back a little bit earlier, if I can, because uh, when I, when I got, came to Ohio and Hal's new, I'm new, um, as I was meeting leaders and talking to folks here, I kept asking, you know, what can Patel do? What, what? And, and one of the things I heard was, if you and OSU can ever figure out a way to work together. And we've done things together <laughs> over the past, but never of the scale you would expect since we're actually neighbors. And, uh, you know, we'd get people together, we'd have these friendly meetings, but we just never made any progress. And I don't know if it was antibodies in the system, if it was just uh, <laughs> culture, if it was sibling rivalry, uh, whatever the case was. But about six, eight months ago, um, Hal and myself started uh, working with our teams on could we potentially build a research center here. And we still have more work to do on that. We've slowed down with that. But, but through that, we built relationships between ourselves um, down into our organizations and started to build, I think, first mutual respect and then some trust. Um, so it was wonderful. So that, that meeting I mentioned in January, one of the things my team did is they set out to, to build a new test for coronavirus. And it was based very closely to the, uh, the WHO and the CDC test, except we were already having supply shortages in those areas. So my very smart people came up with a test that uses slightly different reagents and allowed a different model number of machine to be able to use. So you'd open up a new supply chain to be able to do the testing. And what I loved was, um, we had one night, we were this, we'd started this earlier, and we had one night where our, our team was really yelling and screaming on the mass test because they had just proved that it worked. And literally um, 50 yards away were the people doing the virus, and they were yelling and screaming because they, they had proven that the virus test actually worked and had, uh, had the uh, levels of, um, of consistency uh, that we needed. So I called Hal that night and, and said, Hal, you're working on this? And they were working on one also and said, well, we got one. It works. You know, what if we do this together and get it in? And Hal instantly agreed. Um, we literally had our teams together. Uh, we started moving equipment out of our labs. They started moving equipment out of their research labs. Um, literally, we had vice presidents um, shoulder to shoulder with uh, scrub brushes and bleach in the, in the clinical facilities. We moved it in. And uh, Hal can give the numbers, um, but I know we've been running a couple, uh, we can run 4,500 4, tests a day, I think. I think we're running about a third of that capacity now. And we've been doing this for a while, and it's still uh, Battelle folks walking across the street, sitting shoulder to shoulder with the OSU team. And I think the fact that we'd started that relationship, and, and Hal just brings a, such a great new perspective um, to OSU with his entrepreneurial background, that it's just gotten easier. And, and I think this is giving us the basis, so we're partnering on the, um, the uh, the, the other test now, um, and I, I think we're just building the basis of something that we'll be able to take advantage of long after this emergency. So how many coronavirus tests are you able to run through in a day? 4,500 right now. We could do more. And, and Lou's absolutely right. He literally called me in, on a weekend, and at, at that time, we were doing 40 tests a day, and uh, we were, as you can imagine, so anxious to try to do more. But back then, which seems like about 100 years ago, it was two months ago, we would have to send uh, the specimens to a lab, um, a single lab in the state. That's how things were organized. And that's because it was very early in the process. Those were the approval processes that we had from the FDA and others that were approving these tests. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could partner together and literally come up with a way to do this um, for many, many more patients and do it much faster. And if you recall, at around that time, the turnaround times were literally days. Some of the commercial labs were just getting up to speed, and you could take up to seven days to get a result back, which was incredibly frustrating for everybody. So what we did was we got our teams together, and we found we had uh, some vacant lab space because we had sent many of our researchers home at that point. And they did come in on a Sunday with bleach and scrub brushes and, you know, decontaminated the whole area. And then we moved our machines from other parts of the Ohio State campus into our clinical lab facility. We literally moved about $2 million worth of machines from Battelle as well, and we put it into a single facility. 
and we have 10 machines that are running side by side. The extraordinary part is, is that the, the accuracy of this test is over 99% accurate for detecting the COVID virus. And many of the tests, as you've read in the paper, get nowhere near that level of accuracy. So that's number one. Number two, on some of the machines, the turnaround time is 45 minutes, and on most of the other machines, it's about five to eight hours at the most. So if you send a specimen in, you can get the results back very quickly. So it's the accuracy and it's the scale, 4,500 tests. Here's the remarkable thing. We have by now, so the state at that point said, we'd like to have the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center lab be a, a state reference laboratory. So up to this point now, we have tested one out of every 7.1 Ohioans that have had a test here in Columbus at this joint lab between Battelle and Ohio State Wexner. Um, we do about 45, we, we, we do about 1,000, 1,200 tests a day. We can easily scale up to 4,500 depending on the demand. And sometimes there is a demand, for example, if we have to go into a facility where there's a, a lot of individuals in a congregational setting and close contact. and we Like have a to, nursing home? Like a nursing home, we have to do rapid testing. We're literally doing that today at, at a particular nursing home. We work with various state agencies to do testing across the state. So that was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal, but it gets more interesting. We were running out of test kits. If you recall, and you've seen the pictures in the paper, you have to have a swab that goes to down either the back yeah. of your nose or through your throat if you can't go through the nose. Those, those swabs, which are made out of a plastic material, most of them were made in northern Italy. And as you've all seen the pictures of what was going on in northern Italy early in this pandemic, they were not going to be making a lot of those swabs um, because of the challenges they had. So the supply was running short. So we did the next thing. We said, you know what? Let's work with a couple of other institutions and get the software designed to make these swabs ourselves. And then we took 3D printers from the College of Dentistry, from the College of Engineering at Ohio State. We had a few others. And then we went out and we made our own swabs on those 3D printers. But that wasn't enough. So then we went to Toledo, Ohio. There was an auto parts manufacturer up there, and we partnered with them. We used their 3D printers. They were making plastic auto parts. And today, um, we have created and distributed 100,000 test kits across the state of Ohio. We've distributed in other states, Illinois, New Jersey, and others. And we even made the liquid that you put the specimens into, those swabs, we are producing that liquid at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center from reagents that are you know, off the shelf. Currently, we are assembling, and this is an astounding number even as I say it, 1.2 million test kits here in Columbus at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center so that people can be tested. And we've talked about this here in Ohio. The governor has said how much testing he would like to see happen. We've talked about this at the national level. Without these test kits, it is impossible to get the specimen to one of these machines and get a result back. Are those going to go nationwide, that 1.2 million? So it, if we have a request, we, we absolutely do that. I had a, a request two weekends ago from Mayor de Blasio's office in New York. They needed more of the, the liquid, uh, we call it viral transport media. So we sent over liters of this uh, to do, um, I think it's roughly about 50,000 tests for the city of New York. And then we sent them the actual 3D designs because they have 3D printers in New York, I'm pretty sure. So we sent them the design so they could start printing their own swabs in New York City for their population. We've received already two letters from the city of New York thanking us for the impact this has had on their ability to test. These major institutions are sometimes thought of as being very territorial. You are sounding very collaborative. Is this something you anticipated would be working in the midst of this pandemic this way? I guess I'm not surprised. Um, I always kind of joke that I think America as a country is really bad at planning, but we're really great at reacting. If somebody punches us in the nose, they better watch out. <laughs> and if this virus punches us in the nose. So I'm actually not surprised, and it's really been great to see organizations um, of all different types come together. You know, when we started this, uh, like how with the swabs, uh, you know, we had just sold, now we had this great system, the president's talking about it, um, occasionally getting our name wrong or right, <laughs> you know. And, and um, what the world didn't know is there were five pumps that these systems were run on in the entire world, and we were 
trying to figure out how the heck we were going to deliver these things, and they were done overseas. Um, so again, we worked with that company. They've actually brought production back on shore. We built hundreds of these now, and every one of these um, 60 systems that I mentioned are actually eight of these big van truck vans you see going down the road that are eight by eight by 20. So these are you know, there's a lot there's a lot there to give you the volume to be able to do these masks. And as we work through these supply chains, you know the next mask I clean will be my first one. Um, but the, the leaders and the managers, the things we're doing is managing those supply chains, keeping those pieces going, and there's. There's been a lot of challenges through that, but it's been remarkable to watch um, different companies and organizations all step up to do what they can, uh, and I, we've seen that from everyone. You, this vaccine, I'm old enough to remember when the polio vaccine came out, and we all lined up as children going into our elementary school to get the free vaccine. Do you anticipate that if there ever is a vaccine, certainly if we have one by next January, should this be free to the world? I, I think that there should not be a barrier to getting anyone vaccinated. And certainly, I believe each state, each country is going to should figure out a solution to make that happen. This is a public health issue. And when it comes to public health issues, we don't typically charge for those solutions. You know, I, I think that um, uh, as you can think about it, any type of public health scenario that uh, we've dealt with as a nation, we've always made sure that we had the resources necessary to address it. This is about saving lives and protecting people. And, you know, much like when there's a hurricane or a flood, uh, the first step is to respond and to protect. This pandemic is no different. It's a natural catastrophe. No, you know, no, nobody set out to be in this situation. It happened, and it happened a century ago, and the, the nation responded, the world responded. We have to do the same thing again. But as I'm listening to the two of you describe these teams of scientists and physicians and the equipment needed, the manpower and, and the brain power to put this all together, this is an expensive process, isn't it? Yeah, and I think... Um, you know, when we started all this, we just went out on risk. When Hal, we started doing testing, um, you know, Hal and I didn't talk about how much it was going to cost. Our teams disagreed we'd split it and we'd figure it out later and, and work through that. And we have both had strong enough balance sheets we can do that. Um, so I, I think that's true. But I also think uh, if you listen to most of the public companies that are working on vaccines, they said if they're successful, they're going to be free. You've seen foundations like the Gates Foundation stand up and put million, hundreds of millions of dollars toward building out manufacturing f capability. So I, I think what happened with us, um, even before we got the federal contract, I was already talking to philanthropists that were going to help Patel scale this beyond what I could do on my own in case that federal contract didn't come through. And I think we would see that happen uh, even on a much, much larger scale. Um, it would, this would get solved one way or another so that the world could get the vaccine. You know, uh, we've been told this is the 100-year flu. We haven't seen anything like it since uh, 1918, the Spanish flu. Did you anticipate in your career that you would be seeing this kind of a public health crisis? No. No. I know that, you know, uh, over the years, individuals have, have talked about the possibility of this occurring, um, but uh, the honest answer is no. You, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Did you ever imagine that Patel would be involved in dealing with this kind of a global pandemic? No, I, I don't think we could have. Um, but then, you know, I don't think we envisioned a 9-11. I don't think we envisioned some of the stock market crashes. Uh, I, I think this is obviously an awful and, and terrible thing. Um, but, but I think these things just come along once in a while, and, and, and how we respond is really who separates uh, who's, who in the, who's who in the school, right? And I think this is a chance when, when leaders and organizations can step up and, and prove their value. Both of you obviously have these research teams that have done remarkable things, but we can't forget the frontline nurses, the physicians who are dealing with patients every day, not just the COVID patients, but the other emergencies right. that come into the hospital. And that goes all the way down to the janitors, the people who are delivering food trays. This has been a very stressful time. How is Ohio State dealing with the stress on their frontline workers? Yeah, and the great news is, is that um in as much as there has been an enormous stress on healthcare workers in this country in general, we have a whole host of programs at Ohio State and the Wexner, Wexner Medical Center addressing things such as well-being, such as uh, how to help uh, address 
what we call uh, clinician burnout. And there's been an ongoing initiative at the Wexner Medical Center for the past several years. We have a chief wellness officer at Ohio State. These programs have been in place. And uh, we have incorporated this work and, and actually expanded and scaled this work uh, to address the fact that we do have a workforce that's working exceptionally hard, dealing with very challenging situations, and, um, and we, w we have to support them. That's a responsibility that we have to our workforce. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of all the individuals that have been providing that support. I'm exceptionally proud of the roughly 30,000 physicians, nurses, and staff at the Wexner Medical Center and what they've been able to achieve. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is really all about. And your staff as well has to be feeling the stress. We need a vaccine. We need agents. Mm -hmm. We need equipment. It, this is a stressful time for everyone. Yeah, uh, they're impressive. You know, I have to say I am just so, uh, I'm in awe watching all of them just continue to push as we, uh, take levels, you know, we've done the same thing. We've expanded benefits, we have wellness. When we got the mass system available, uh, we put a call out for employees because we, we knew we'd hire people to support, but we needed Patel leaders to run each of those sites because if, if you see the people um, cleaning the mass, you know, they're in full bunny suits with, because um, the mask may have the virus and you don't want them to be exposed. So we actually had to go through some training. We had hundreds of our people volunteer to do that and many of them we've redeployed onto different programs and, um, and, and they've just stepped up. They're going out for three weeks at a time uh, into cities all over the country, into some of the hot spots, and God bless them. Um, it's just, just been, I've been very proud of them. I, I would add one more thing. It's, it's not just how individual organizations are doing this. It's how, as a community, we're all working together. And Lou mentioned this before. I mean, literally, Battelle and Ohio State Wexner are across the street from each other, literally across the street. And what's occurred as a res response to this pandemic is this collaboration. And I think it's in many ways framed by the Columbus Way, and it's framed by the Columbus Partnership and this approach that exists here in the ethos of this city to create these kinds of collaborations. And as a result, we've seen enormous philanthropy that has come to support our employees, our doctors and nurses at the Wexner Medical Center to support the work they do to help them, including food, including resources, to help us purchase PPE to protect the workforce and to protect patients. It's how everyone is pulled together. And I, you know, gets, gets back earlier to what we've seen in this community as opposed to many other communities in this country. A lot of it starts with that culture. And that culture is something that is unique and something we truly should celebrate when we're done dealing with this um, incredible situation that we face right now. Well, I know Jane has some questions as we've been on the, on the air, on the web right now. Some of our viewers have some questions, and we welcome those. And go ahead, Jane. Well, I think this is a great segue for Megan Gibney, who's at The Ohio State University. In what ways can OSU and Battelle continue their research partnership? What can we achieve together that we couldn't by, our, by ourselves? So maybe uh, I think what she's asking is some pie in the sky. Once this is over, what other problems would you tackle? I'll start let you jump in. So we were already looking at uh, a project we did together five or six years ago where Battelle did the engineering and OSU did the surgery, is we actually um, put a sensor into a paraplegic's head and we can now decode his brain signals, transfer those signals to a sleeve on his arm and he can now brush his teeth, uh, play Wii guitar, do things just by thinking. And, and that can go so much further. Uh, and we've actually talked about, that's what we were working on before this pandemic hit, and we've kind of put it on the side for a little bit. Um, is there a neurotechnology with the, the vast resources of Ohio State in the clinical settings, with our, uh, our ability and, and understanding of the software and the control pieces of this? I think that there's so much more we could do for uh, injured Americans, uh, dis disabled, uh, battlefield injuries, stroke victims. Uh, just one of, you know, many areas that I think Patel uh, and, and OSU are, are primed to work on. Yeah, and I, I would just add this. The other side of this uh, situation, this once-in-a-lifetime situation, is the economic impact. Um, and we're going to see cities and we're going to see a nation that's going to be changed in, in many, many ways as a result of this public health crisis. Um, I think we have an enormous responsibility as two organizations to collaborate and think about ways that we can harness the one thing that makes us totally unique, which is innovation. Mm -hmm. 
It's what makes Battelle unique. It's what, what makes Ohio State and its Wexner Medical Center unique is this opportunity to take great ideas and innovate around them and then partner together to create new opportunities in the city, in the state, uh, which also, when successful, will create economic opportunities as well. Jobs, work, everything that we do will be in many ways changed and touched by this. We need to make these investments of, of ideas and, and, and innovation to create new opportunities for this community. And I think that's something that we can do together that's important. And Lou and I have looked at a few other cities around this country where they've created these really world-class innovation hubs that are spinning off new businesses and new jobs and, and new ways of, of doing business. And I think there's um, a lot that we can do here in a very similar way. And that's what we're, we were working on before this occurred. And as he said a few minutes ago, we had to put that on pause for a minute. But we're very, very anxious to get back into that work. Lou, I think you should plug in the number of patents coming out of Patel right now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've really, uh, the last three years, we've really turned up our, um, our innovation and our strategies around um, how we invest and how we look. And we have a thing we call a, an IDR, which is the beginning of a um, patent idea that an engineer puts out. And, you know, we were doing 30, 40 of those a year, um, you know, a few years ago. We're doing over 400 a year now. So I think we've been making the investments and we're on the back end now where a lot of these innovations are coming out. And what we need is partners who can take them into clinical environments, uh, who can give us access to, to broader um, student student bases and, and broader parts of, inter, of, of of energy in lots of places. And the exciting part that, um, that I believe is, is as Hal mentioned, um, Columbus is a great town, OSU is a fabulous university, Battelle is a great company. We've never had the three of them come together in a way that, that's created more than what each three are individually. And I think we had the opportunity to really change that and turn this into an even bigger entrepreneurial center than it already is and, and create that next generation of jobs, create those things that are going to transform our workforce um, over the next generation. It's interesting. A couple weeks ago when Alex Fisher was here from the partnership, he commented that after World War II was one of the most transformative times in the, in the United States and in the world, and he felt that this next uh, decade was going to be the most transformative time perhaps in this whole century. So you're, you're uh, echoing comment here. Which uh, brings me to a question from Celina Fabrizi. How has telehealth ramped up, and how do you see this becoming a new way to deliver health care? Well, um, it, it has been a game changer. I know when I first arrived here, uh, almost it's a year ago next month, um, I started several initiatives looking at telehealth, and, you know, we, we were working on some things, and it, it is certainly a different way to do it. Um, and the Wexner Medical Center has been, you know, at capacity for a long time and, you know, the argument was patients want to get their care the old-fashioned way and we should continue to do it. And um, I kept on pressing on it, but honestly everyone was so busy that it was not a priority for many folks. As a matter of fact, in February of this year, so three months ago, we were doing roughly 50 uh, telehealth visits a month. Today, we have days when we do over 3,000 telehealth visits a day, over 3,000 a day. I, I think it speaks volumes about how the, the physicians and our nurse practitioners have stepped up to this challenge, and we are using all different types of technology to create telehealth visits for our patients um, because we recognize that um, uh, when we had to make beds available uh, for uh, COVID-positive patients and when we had to stop seeing patients in the clinics to preserve PPE, we had to find another way to deliver care. And the best way to do that was using telehealth technology. And I think this is the new reality. This is where the future is going to be, that a significant portion of the care we deliver will be over telehealth. And we're going to be able to do more things asynchronously. You know, let's send a van to your home. We now have a number of mobile vans that go out across the community. And let's go out to your home, your local community, can we do some of that work right there for you? Can we focus on things that are part of your health or your lack of good health, addressing social determinants of health, behavioral determinants of health, even environmental determinants of health by getting into local communities? Telehealth allows us to do that, and we can support that 
with this workforce, this phenomenal workforce we have in, this, in, in Columbus. Last week, we were handing out what we call community care kits uh, on the east side of, of uh, Columbus, helping uh, communities that have had a lot of challenges over the years uh, around social determinants of health. And we were giving them masks, we were giving them hand sanitizer, soap, information from the CDC about how to protect themselves. When we can take the infrastructure and the power of a place like the Wexner Medical Center with all of its technology, with all of its life-saving care, and then marry that up with care in the local community in the home that addresses a whole host of issues that contribute to poor health, we can change the health of a community. And frankly, at the end of the day, that's why we're here. Just a few months ago, if you had said to most patients, we're just going to talk to you over the phone, we're going to FaceTime, just telehealth, they would have said, no, I want my doctor to see me. Mm -hmm. Now don't you think people are saying, well, they better just be willing to talk to me over the phone because I'm not leaving my house right now. Uh, it's a mindset, isn't it? It is, it is a mindset, and you get used to it. And, you know, frankly, I think some patients are going to say, do I want to wait for an appointment? Do I want to jump in the car and drive 30 minutes? Do I want to go through a parking deck or a parking lot somewhere, go into a waiting room and wait to be seen if a lot of that can be cared for over some type of device. Absolutely. Well, we do have a lot of questions, so I hope we get to uh, as many as possible. Kathy Fox uh, asked when she registered, uh, often our choices in this pandemic are presented as, quote, open up the economy and lose lives, or keep the economy closed and lose livelihoods. How can the kinds of innovations that Battelle and OSU Medical Center have been leading help us stay safe and regrow our economy in Central Ohio? Can we continue to innovate, retool, retrain, and scale up safety to employ a lot more people? We've answered some of that. So, so I, I, I mean, I think that's happening. I think the PPE that Hal talked about, and, and so we know what it takes to be safe. And, and I think we all support, we've been running our labs, they've been running the hospital. Um, we know ways to do this safely. We've also had uh, no cases actually inside uh, core battalion yet. Yeah, we've had some on the peripheries. Um, and, and we know we can do this safely. So I think to take those tools and things that we do know and get people back to work, but with it you need to make sure you have sanitizer, the, the face mask, you have the ability to, to do all those things that everybody's telling you to do. And I think if we do that, we can get much of what we had before back while we continue to, you know, hopefully we'll get treatments and a vaccine that will, uh, you know, get this behind us once and for all at some point. This is a tough question, Java Kittrick, Puffin Foundation West. Why isn't anyone telling the youth in Columbus that they are complicit in attempting to murder family members, friends of friends, community members, and children by not practicing safe distancing, by not wearing masks, just like CMH has the highest number of HIV? Well, I think there is a, a lot of great communication going out across the region from the governor, lieutenant governor, from uh, director, uh, Dr. Amy Acton. I think all the healthcare institutions in this community are, are doing um, uh, everything they can to communicate this. Um, it really depends on all of us being responsible and doing the right thing. And, um, and when that doesn't occur, it depends on all of us as uh, uh, community members living in the same community to speak up and, and ask everyone to, to follow what is uh, the appropriate things to protect their friends, families, and neighbors. From Opal Bryant, how has the pandemic affected workforce and staffing? Is there a increased need for training? And I'm assuming that she means training within everyone's office and work environments. So from a Battelle standpoint, um, we haven't had, we've been very fortunate we've not had anyone's paycheck impacted by this to this point. And as I mentioned earlier, we've actually added about 800 new workers that we've deployed around the country uh, with this mass system. Um, we have had to do some training on how to work remotely, how to tie in. We brought some new tools on board. So, you know, we have had to learn how to work differently, which our teams have adapted to. And, and I think we're also wrestling now with is any of this permanent and um, what parts and how does that work and we're keeping a close eye on that we're going to kind of let the endorphins wear off uh, well as Hal said we're all working uh, double time right now and uh, as that 
gets back to a more normalcy, um, where can we act, still work efficiently, uh, maybe differently than we used to, and learn from this experience? So I would say this is front of mind at Ohio State. We have uh, the largest contingent of health science colleges in the nation and on a single campus. And we have about 10,000 health science students, everything from medicine to nursing to veterinary medicine, dentistry, I mean, the list goes on. And education goes on each and every day. I can tell you that um, we have looked at how we should continue to change the curriculum. I mean, these students were having their education, talk about telehealth, they were doing distance learning uh, beginning uh, early in the pandemic, and that's been the way they've been educated. We're now uh, working on ways to get them back into the clinical setting for their education. But there are going to be enormous changes in how we educate this next generation of healthcare practitioner as a result of this. As I said earlier, you know, 3,000 telehealth visits a day, shame on us if we're not training all of those students on how to do part of their clinical work over telehealth. And then from there, we can build on how do we educate workforces across the region and the state as well. Um, it may be easier to explain to a doctor or a nurse what they need to do appropriately for someone that works in an industry where they've never had to think about these things, clearly more challenging. But the things are, that they need to do are not very complicated. They're really very simple. It just takes good communication, good instructional material, and some repetition to help them address opportunities to protect themselves and their coworkers as they return to work. We are almost out of time, but before I let you go, first I have to remark on how amazing it is that we have these two incredible institutions side by side in the heart of Columbus, and thank you for what you're doing to fight COVID-19. But I want to hear a final word from each of you on your optimism for how we're going to get through this going forward through the rest of the year. So, so I think um, I'm a natural optimist, and. Uh, I think we've gone through worse as a society in our history. We'll go through worse than this in the future. Um, you know, I, we, we will get through this. We don't know exactly how it's going to look or how it's going to come together, but I'm confident we will. You know, another thing we've done at Patel is we have literally shifted from STEM education with our philanthropy focus to help food banks and shelter during these times. And I think all of us just continuing to help each other as a community, um, you know, we'll get through this just fine. Yeah, and I would totally agree. Um, you know, a critical care physician, and uh, by training and practice, uh, and uh, to do that, you need to be a, a natural optimist. So I carry that with me each and every day. And I would say this: uh, our nation has been through many challenges since our founding, and we have managed to not only survive them but overcome them and go well past them in terms of enormous success. Um, and I have every confidence in the world that we will do that again here. It's, it's challenging, without a doubt, but we have um, all the resources and, the, and, and really the willpower and, and, and the, the necessary energy to get through this and get to the other side. I'm, I'm very confident we can do that, but we have to take practical steps to get from here to the other side of this pandemic. Um, as a nation, we will do that, we can do that, and uh, we need to continue to work together. We need to continue to have uh, extraordinary leadership like we've seen here in Ohio. Um, but all of us together can get through this and, and succeed and even come out better as a result. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Well, once again, we've seen reality balanced by optimism. I heard somebody say the most important thing to stop the spread is basic. It's individual behavior, so that's kind of on all of us. Adaptive, game changer, extraordinary, collaboration between the health systems and partnerships, all good words for today's forums. We hope you'll tune in next Wednesday at noon for a very interesting conversation with Chad Whittington, the president and CEO of Kappa, and Brian Ross, the president and CEO of Experience Columbus, as we continue our live stream special report series. We're grateful for today's support from the Puffin Foundation West, honoring Dr. Mark Earl Pierce and Cardinal Health, and our live stream partners, NBC4, NBC4i, PNC, WSU Public Media, Tommy Daly Foundation, Morpsey, the Dispatch Media Group, and OSU Wexner Medical Center. And thank you very sincerely uh, for our speakers, Lou Von Thayer and Dr. Hal Paz, 
We know you guys have other things to do, so we appreciate the time that you're spending with us. And Colleen, thank you once again for an extraordinary program today. Thanks to all of you who purchased virtual seats for today's program. We're truly grateful that you're with us uh, through this special series. Be safe, wash your hands, stay safe, stay safe and stay well. We'll see you again next week.